Here is what's coming up on your horizon. Well, by the time the class of 2013's children are themselves in college, our country will at the very least look very different. More than half of all babies born last year were members of minority groups, the first time in U.S. history. It's a sign of how swiftly the USA is becoming a nation of younger minorities and older whites. Today, our focus is on our country's changing demographics and the impact it has on everything from our schools to our economy. Stay with us for Oklahoma Horizon. Oklahoma Horizon is made possible by the Oklahoma Department of Career and Technology Education. Oklahoma's investment in career tech provides more than nationally recognized technology education and training. It produces solid financial returns for the state's economic future. Oklahoma Career Tech, elevating our economy. And the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping good people grow good things. And now, from the Career Tech Studios in Stillwater, here's your host, Rob McClendon. Hello everyone, thanks for joining us here on Horizon. Well, America was built by immigrants who converged from around the world looking for a better life. Over the past two decades, we've witnessed a steady growth in the number of foreign-born residents from right at 8% of our population in 1990 to over 13% in 2010. It's been called the browning of America due to the fact that over the past 20 years, over half of those new residents are from Latin America. In fact, the big surprise for many in the latest census was just how quickly our Latino population has grown. And nowhere has that growth been more dramatic than in Texas. So we headed down I-35 to look at how changing demographics are changing America. <laughs> It's fiesta time in San Antonio, Texas, and Police Sergeant James Warner is walking his beat, patrolling a city in a state where, as a white male, Hi, sweetie. he's in the minority. You like a sticker? I grew up here and picked up a little Spanish along the way, but it's been a predominantly Hispanic, Latin, Mexican culture. It's a wonderful culture. It's uh, very pleasant, very loving, very family-oriented, very strong families. While Texas may have won its independence from Mexico in 1836, here in the Alamo City, Mexican influence always remained. Everything from the local culture to the local cuisine screams Tex-Mex. I see, I see, I see. Now, if this plate of quesadillas were Texas, roughly half is now Hispanic. But here in San Antonio, that number's now at 64%. And many believe as San Antonio goes, so goes Texas. And as Texas goes, so goes the nation. We did not cross the border, the border crossed us. Octavio Hinojosa is with San Antonio's Hispanic Chamber. We're probably now the second largest single ethnic group in the United States after Americans who have of German background. A growth fueled more by higher birth rates in the Latino community than by immigration. What this means that is that the United States Hispanic community is the 15th largest consumer market in the world. With an economic purchasing power of over $1 trillion and growing. So there is a strong uh, potential of further growth because we are still a very young population. Uh, a third of the, uh, the U.S. Hispanic community population is still under the age of 18 ha and has yet to enter the workforce. And so what we basically are see witnessing is uh, a second version of a, of a baby boom, if you will. Which does present its own set of challenges all across Texas. Welcome to Castleberry Elementary, the exact same hallways that I walked down as a child. And while they do seem decidedly narrower these days, the real differences are when you open the yearbook and look who makes up the classes. Meet Renee Smith Faulkner, a classmate of mine and now the assistant superintendent over technology. 
So how has the old alma mater changed since we graduated? Well, some things have stayed the same. Huh? However, there are a lot of changes, especially in our demographics. Mm -hmm. uh, and probably when I first came into this position in 2001, we reported that our Hispanic population was about 40%. Mm -hmm. In our last PEAM submission, uh, we were about 75%. So what has that meant for instruction and curriculum? Well, we've had to change instruction. We've had to definitely send our teachers to staff development. Mm -hmm. We've had uh, staff development and implemented dual language programs, enrichment mm -hmm. programs. Mm -hmm. That are now in both English and in Spanish. School superintendent, Gary Jones. We required our teachers to have ESL training, uh, English as a second language, so they would understand the techniques and how to reach out for the kids and really re-educated our staff. Um, once we got that in place, then we started really working on our parents. Going as far as to offer night classes to parents wanting to learn English too. We found the best way for that was to always include the kid. They would be explaining to mom and dad this is what I'm doing, this is how I'm doing, and it was both in Spanish and English. And while it has taken effort on everyone's part to meld the two cultures, it's also taken some new money. We're a very small district, so you don't really anticipate a lot of growth. But what we've experienced as our community has aged and as new families have, they have moved out, new families have moved in, and those families have children. The latest census numbers show seven of every 10 births in Texas are now to minorities, with Hispanics accounting for 65% of Texas's booming population growth. We've probably gained 400 kids in the last five to six years, which may not be a lot for a large district, but when you start off at 3,200 kids, you add 400, that's a significant increase. Especially on the elementary school level. Classrooms bursting at the seams and school buildings once adequate suddenly obsolete. Well, growing up, this old pine tree was right outside my bedroom window. And while the old tree still stands, not much of the old neighborhood does. In fact, my home, as well as others in the neighborhood, were torn down to make way for a desperately needed new elementary school. And while the old neighborhood may never look the same, the changes underway, Hinojosa believes, only makes our country stronger. We live in a country that changes with every generation. There's nothing to, to fear. In fact, it's even better because what we're seeing is our country is renewed with every generation. I think in, in the end of the day, it's just a matter of learning to appreciate who we are as Americans because we're changing with every generation. Well, the foreign-born population in the U.S. has been growing steadily over the past two decades, with the largest group of foreign-born coming from Latin America, but more and more undocumented workers are getting a one-way ticket home. The number of illegal immigrants deported by the United States doubled in the past decade to almost 400,000 last year, and of those, almost half were convicted criminals. When we return, we face the facts on some significant demographic changes here at home. You're watching Oklahoma Horizon featuring some of the good things that are happening in the great state of Oklahoma. Well, the United States is often called a melting pot, but in many ways, we're more of a red, white, and blue salad of traditions and contradictions. Now, while we are more multicultural, there has been a big shift in the immigrant tide. Illegal immigration from Mexico has slowed since 2005, ending what was the largest immigration of a single ethnic group. Yet here in Oklahoma, we have just in the last decade begun to feel the impact. According to the latest census, Hispanics have overtaken American Indians as our largest ethnic minority. If you will, let's take a look at some numbers. According to the U.S. Census Bureau data, the Hispanic community in Oklahoma City almost doubled between 2000 and 2010, from just over 50,000 to now over 100,000 residents. And while fewer Hispanics live in the Tulsa metro area, that Latino community almost doubled to 55,000 in the latest count. And this is just not an urban phenomenon. Growth in the Hispanic community is playing an increasingly important role in rural areas. 
from 2002 2010, rural counties in the U.S. increased population by 2.2 million residents. And of those, 54% were Hispanic. But that, too, could be changing. Asians and not Hispanics are now the leading class of immigrants here into the U.S. About 430,000 Asian immigrants arrived in the U.S. in 2010, compared to about 370,000 people of Hispanic origin. And as we told you earlier in the show, with deportations growing under the Obama administration, the number of illegal Mexican immigrants coming into the U.S. is now smaller than the number returning to their home. Now to see more facts just like this, head to our website where we have daily updates from Face the Facts USA. Still to come on Oklahoma Horizon, the benefits of being bilingual. But first, the rule of unintended consequences. Well, longtime immigration advocate State Senator Harry Coates says the lack of a guest worker program in Oklahoma is hurting business. Coates says the current oil boom has pulled many workers away from minimum wage jobs in Oklahoma's smaller communities for much higher paying jobs with oil companies. And Coates believes having a guest worker program in place would allow those business owners wanting for workers to be able to fill those positions. With more, here's Courtney Dehoff. It's estimated that nearly 12 million undocumented workers now live in the United States, but a growing number of states, including Oklahoma, are passing more stringent anti-immigration laws, which, according to some in Oklahoma's business community, has hurt our economy. When Oklahoma lawmakers passed the most comprehensive immigration reform in the nation, I declare the same to have passed it was met with considerable reluctance. This bill is a sham. The truth of the matter is there is not an available pool of labor to replace the immigrant worker in Oklahoma. There's not one word in this bill that's going to remove And those fears are still alive and well today. But what has happened in Oklahoma as a result of, of House Bill 1804 that we passed uh, a few years ago was driving away a willing workforce. Senator Harry Coates is one of a growing they number of lawmakers so wanting to revise Oklahoma's immigration law, saying control. it's bad said, for you business. Guys are killing us up there. Yeah. You're killing us. 1804 drove out a willing workforce that, that did those jobs, those jobs that required a lot of physical labor, and that, that was in landscaping, uh, construction, typically. And, and mostly in, in road building and home building and commercial construction. You, you have to have a certain number of people to do the things that machines cannot do. The medium and high skilled employees aren't, gonna, aren't going to do those jobs. There's plenty for them to do. There is not a willing workforce in today's economy, today's time, uh, to take those low tier jobs. Coates says jobs that our neighbors to the south have absorbed, ultimately taking business away from Oklahoma. We drove them across the Red River to go to work for Texas companies that don't care about our laws. Those companies freely come back across the Red River and compete with Oklahoma contractors that don't have a workforce now and take our jobs from us. But the author of Oklahoma's immigration bill, Randy Terrell, disagrees. The, the business organizations uh, who are defending uh, their ability to exploit and subjugate an entire group of people are not being good corporate citizens. Uh, that's what it boils down to. Uh, and listen, they make these uh, arguments which are disingenuous, uh, that these are folks who are here performing jobs that uh, no American wants to do. And my question to you would be, how insulting is that? Uh, the reality is that there is no job that an American citizen is not willing to do. They're just not willing to do it at the wage rates and non-existent benefit levels uh, that are being paid to illegal aliens to do that work. 
Um, and, and these folks who, again, have profited quite handsomely in many cases from this abundance of cheap illegal alien labor uh, conveniently overlook the fact that we live in a competitive free market economy and that in the absence of this cheap illegal alien labor that wage rates and benefit levels will adjust up to the point that there will be an abundance of U.S. citizen workers who are more than happy to perform those jobs. Back in D.C. Had to act but Oklahoma to Farm Bureau's Mike Spradling says there are certain jobs that put plain and simply Americans just don't want to do. And without immigrant workers who are willing to get dirty, we may find our dinner tables more sparse without the fruits of their labor. Certainly there's a lot of people out of work, but they're not willing to do the work that's required in, in harvest of crops, of fruits, and vegetables that's, that we all across this nation, it's very time sensitive. We have to not only have the people willing to do the work, we have to have them at a very specific point in time. So all these things have to come together in order to keep us from, again, uh, potentially putting at risk that anywhere from five to nine billion dollars of our product. Raising a simple question. Why do we want to do that to our economy? There are plenty of jobs, plenty of jobs. Why not let this immigrant workforce take the jobs we don't want to do? Get them out of the shadows, allow them to pay their taxes, allow them to, to have their immediate families here where they can care for them and don't have to live in fear of them getting deported. Allow businesses to treat them fairly, complete the contracts that they are required to complete, and let's all enjoy the fruits of everyone's labor, labor at every stage. Well, one thing lawmakers do agree on is that the growth in Oklahoma's Hispanic population can be traced back to a single factor, job availability. Earlier, I was able to sit down with Oklahoma's Secretary of Commerce, Dave Lopez. Changing demographics, I think, are a huge advantage for a state. It's a global economy. So if we have a, a mixture of cultures that we depend on as our citizenry, as, as we depend on for our workforce, I think that's an enriching factor. And then when you think about the sort of growth that Oklahoma is experiencing, particularly with its growth in the Hispanic sector, uh, one, it says it's a place where people want to be and we should take pride in that. I think it also says that uh, people sense this is a, a, a place for opportunity and uh, for them to come and, and think of the uh, new world example that Oklahoma presents, uh, I think is again a compliment to the state. Uh, beyond that is what we're finding is that uh, again, as demographics change and the general base of population hasn't grown as fast, there's a much more dynamic factor in the Hispanic community. And when you think about employers and wanting more quality employees, well, it starts with having that more. And so the energizing force and additional numbers that we get uh, with the variety of cultures that Oklahoma is now attracting is exciting to me. Is the key to that through education? Education is fundamental. I, regardless of whether you're new to a community, new to a culture, uh, I think it's, uh, it's the prerequisite for, for everything we do. It's the building block for our advancement. Not only we think in terms of jobs and employment, uh, but that's what enriches our democracy. It's, it's how our citizenry is based. All right, thank you so much. David Lopez, Oklahoma's Secretary of Commerce. Oklahoma Horizon is now portable. Just subscribe to our weekly podcast. Visit iTunes.com where you can download our show for your listening or viewing convenience. Well, here's something to think about. When it comes to the language of business, English is the most widely spoken. But after that, it's not Japanese, French, or even Mandarin Chinese that comes in second. It is Spanish which is why one Tulsa school is offering a bilingual education. Joining me now is our Andy Barth. Well, Rob, the American workforce is evolving on a daily basis. In the next 10 years, as many as 87 million baby boomers will retire. And as of now, there are only 57 million people ready to replenish American jobs. And a growing trend in states like Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas is that Hispanics are a growing part of the work-ready age group making it necessary for our young people to become bilingual. At first glance, it's your typical elementary school. But if you listen closely, the words being sung are in Spanish. Our uh, mission is to grow successful global citizens. And so I think that everything we do, we try to tie back to that mission. 
Ana, su hermana. Inside these classrooms, you'll hear as much Spanish as English. Peggy Moss is the school's principal. Immersion is basically learning content and all the objectives and skills that you normally would in school, but through a second language. Our kids come in at pre-K and they learn the same curriculum as the rest of Tulsa Public Schools. They just learn it um, through Spanish, and in that process, they're actually learning the Spanish language. Um, at this age, the child's brain is like a sponge for language. They're still learning their own language. And in Michelle Sign's kindergarten class, the learning curve is set pretty high. I think every child needs to have a second language because we're so diverse, and also because it's a uh, more important for when they're older, they have more opportunities in the job market. For signs, teaching kindergarten is a first, but the payoff is big. I've never worked with the, the little ones before, and I have ones that are already counting by tens. You know, working in third grade, I didn't even see that until the end of third grade, so it's really exciting. And then I have those ones that are trying their hardest, and um, just the, those light bulb moments when they just they get it, you know, and it's really exciting. And for students Brisa Flores and Kai Luckenbach, learning in a second language is just no big deal. I like speaking Spanish here. Um, because we learn how to speak two languages. I like doing the centers and doing the calendar. The dual immersion part is a very important part of our school. If you don't have parents at home who can help you with your homework, in the classroom is where they have to really get their skills and strategies to be able to tackle the work that we give them. And it's the same for the English speakers too because their parents usually can't help them with their homework either because they don't speak Spanish. So they're all in the same boat and they're just learning side by side two different populations that might not you know, really be um, working together otherwise. So we find that component of our program probably one of the most important and actually defining pieces of our program. Bridging a cultural gap while cultivating today's young minds. Now, when the school began, it only offered pre-K and kindergarten, but it plans to add one grade each year through fifth grade. So just how unique is this type of school? Well, Rob, there are two other immersion schools in the Tulsa area, but they don't offer dual immersion, which is where students are taught half in Spanish and the other time in English. All right. Thanks so much, Andy. You're welcome, Rob. Next time on Oklahoma Horizon, the future of Oklahoma's growing manufacturing sector. There has been a big change in an evolution in manufacturing, and manufacturing today is not what manufacturing was like in the 1970s or 1980s. Plus, we'll meet some Oklahoma stars at this year's Entertainment Awards. The Oklahoma Show for the Heartland, Oklahoma Horizon. Well, concerns over the browning of America is certainly one of perspective. That's because for a guy named McClendon, I'm just not very white, thanks to the Native American blood coursing through these veins. It's not uncommon for people, albeit mostly apologetically, just to come out and ask, what are you? A question that may get posed more and more often as America becomes a majority minority nation. And while talking about ethnicity is certainly a subject we should embrace, it can, and even has in my own life, taken some rather odd turns. I was just a kid the first time I learned that some people saw me as different when a little girl who had a crush on me and was being kidded by her classmates blurted out, I would never kiss him because he's not white. And trust me on this one, that was much to my own surprise. Now, later in life, when I was starting my television career, I did have my share of rejection letters because I did not have what they called the right look. But it was after 9-11 when I was standing in my underwear behind a curtain in Francis Charles de Gaulle Airport getting interrogated that it became painfully obvious that being browner is not always better. If you would, meet my daughter Tiffany. With her bright red hair and fair complexion, we do make a rather unique family portrait. A few years back, she was helping me lay sod in the backyard when we ran out. So we jump in the truck covered in dirt to go pick up some more. 
on our way back. I made a wide turn because of the heavy load and lo and behold, I get pulled over for turning into the outside lane. Guilty as charged. But it was when the officer began questioning the relationship between my redheaded daughter and me, the conversation began to feel racist. Ever since then, I've been skeptical of recently passed laws in some states that turn law enforcement into immigration control, that just by the color of someone's skin, we try to determine their citizenship. Like any change in society, there will be certainly growing pains with this browning of America. But here is why I'm optimistic. Despite what you may have heard in some recent political campaigns, our culture is one of inclusion, and it's that diversity of thought that is one of America's greatest strengths. If you look at places like Japan and many European countries, they have a rapidly aging workforce with a diminishing number of young people to take their place. Yet, thanks to our booming youth population, which is due almost entirely to communities of color, that is not something we have to worry about. So while illegal immigration is an economic and social issue for this country, it may well be the sons and daughters of immigrants, whether undocumented or not, who will integrate into society and be paying the taxes that support the services like Social Security and Medicare that my generation, no matter the color of our skin, will most certainly depend upon. I'm Rob McClendon. Thanks for watching. See you back here next week.